uh, classes from this semester by talking about uh, uh, bosonization. Um, and eventually we will talk about, I suppose you could call it fermionization. Okay. Um, so uh, the, qu the question of why we are doing this, this, this will be very useful when computing uh, scattering amplitudes in the superstring. May not be immediately obvious to you when we start our discussion why, why it's re relevant to us, but it will be obvious in a lecture or two. So let's just start. Okay. So you remember that last semester we studied two conformal field theories very thoroughly. We studied many, but two particularly thoroughly. One of them was the theory of free bosons, which was defined by 1 by 4 pi alpha prime uh, del x del x. This Lagrangian we studied very thoroughly. Okay? And uh, the other Lagrangian that we studied quite thoroughly was uh, uh, psi del psi, uh, maybe with 1 by 2 pi. This Lagrangian we studied quite thoroughly as well. Uh, this was the, the free uh, fermion conformal field theory. I'm going to remind you about various, um, various things about these, these, these conformal field theories. Uh, the first thing we, uh, we studied about the first, the boson theory, was that it had x of z1, x of z2, went like minus alpha prime by 2 log of mod z squared. Okay. Uh, the basic uh, OP formula here was like BC, right? So psi of z1, psi of z2, um, <coughs> Uh, uh, psi of Z1, Psi of Z2. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not quite like BC because this is one real part of it. Right. So, uh, Psi of Z1, Psi of Z2 went like how? Let's see. Uh, uh, how does? Uh, yeah, but how, how does it, it's probably just Z1, Z2, right? Huh. Uh, uh, two, two. What? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, but uh, it should be zero when Z1 uh, is equal to Z2. No, we, we, if you remember when we start, last time we started with the real fermion, there was no psi bar. Okay, so let's forget psi bar for a moment. Okay. Uh, how does that go? Uh, how does how do how do that go? Just a minute. Uh, yeah, you, you guys must be right where I'm getting confused about something elementary, which is that when z1 is equal to z2, this thing should vanish, right? It should be uh, small. La okay, let's, let's remi remember what we actually know from the BC thing, which is what Schumann wanted, which was psi psi bar. So in, if we started with 1 by 2 pi integral psi bar del psi, then we have, uh, I'll check the overall signs in a moment. Psi bar of z1, psi of z2 goes like 1 by z12. And we also had psi of z1, psi bar of z2 also goes like 1 by z12. And let me figure out now what I wanted from here. Because we can write psi is equal to psi1 plus i psi2. And psi bar is equal to psi1 minus i psi2. So this was like psi 1, psi 1. Okay, so psi 1 was equal to psi plus psi bar and psi, uh, psi 1 is psi plus psi bar uh, by 2. And psi 2 is something similar. But let's, let's, look, at, uh, uh, let's look at this. 
Um, it just adds up, right? How does that work? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Yeah, but what happened to the fact? There's something wrong, just me. It's an irrelevant thing, but let me get it straight. Sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, it should just be zero. Sorry, wait. So let me just work it out. So this is psi of z1 plus psi bar of z1 over 2 times uh, psi of z2 plus psi bar of z2 over 2. Um, now let's do the OPE. This, this is zero. I couldn't see that. This is z1, z2, and z1, z2. I mean, isn't it adding up? No, no. The whatever came to the left had. Whatever came to the left, it was Z12 because of anti commuting. Right? Suppose we take this to the left of that, that will become minus of this which will then become Z21. So this was OK, correct? Here we get 1 over Z12. And here, sorry, so here we get 1 over Z12. And here we also get 1 over Z12. Aren't we getting uh, 1 over 2 Z12? Perhaps we are getting that. I can't see what, sorry, there's something elementary that's confusing. Uh, yeah, psi one and psi. Well, yeah, I, I, you're asking whether psi psi bar is zero. Uh, sorry, psi psi is zero. Yeah, yeah. You, you want me to check that? That should be zero. Uh, let's check it. Um, so up to some factor of i, this will be a minus. And that will uh, be zero. In fact, it will be exactly zero. So, 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 sorry, elementary thing. This must be the right answer. Uh, why is it OK? Just a minute. Well, I suppose it is OK. As a, what is not, yeah, the normal, I suppose it just is okay. Uh, yeah, what would make no sense is normal ordered operator yeah. psi of zero, the whole thing square. I suppose that's the point. OK, sorry. There's something more to say about this? Dimensionality, this is the only thing that. Well, dimensionality can't, can't allow you to, uh, can't forbid 0. Yeah, I mean, it can be either 0 or some, yeah. I mean, it, it, it could have been 0, but. It could have been 0. And then, for instance, then, psi with psi is 0. Yeah. No, but then the entire theory would be trivial, completely trivial, right? Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. You're right. You're right. It could just have been. OK, anyway, you're right. You're right that this was uh, <coughs> 1 by z1, 2 uh, uh, up to some normalizations, which I won't try to get completely straight. I won't try to get completely straight. Uh, OK. There's still something about this that confuses me a little bit. But once I get completely clear in my mind about it, I'll tell you what. OK, fine. But the main point of today's lecture was, uh, uh, was to explain to you that these two conformal field theories, which at first look completely different from each other, 
actually have uh, a quite surprising connection between them. Okay, um, and the actual connection is between this theory and this theory, the theory of complex fermions. Okay, and the uh, theory of a single single real boson. Well, one obvious connection between them is the following: the theory of a single real boson is C equals one. The theory of a single real fermion is C equals half. So a complex fermion has C equals one as well. So at least they have the same central charge. Okay, and I want to explain to you that there is some sense in which uh, these are actually uh, the same theory. More precisely, the chiral algebras of these are actually the same theory. And uh, there is a version of them that is literally the same theory. So I'm going to explain what I mean. Now, when we were working with the <coughs> uh, when we were working with the free boson, we worked with this uh, this normalization here, one by four pi alpha prime, and then minus alpha prime by two with the log. Uh, and whenever we're working with bosons that live in space time, this is convenient normalization. But often we will be working with abstract bosons. Yes. <coughs> Just uh, exactly abstract bosons. Uh, that I introduced because they are equivalent to fermions, for instance. Okay, whenever we deal with such uh, such bosons, we will we will call them H, and we will use the Lagrangian one by two pi del H del H. So this is equivalent to setting alpha prime is equal to half. Uh, half. Now, did I want to send alpha prime equals actually two? Sorry, just a minute. I'll check what put you see this. Maybe I wanted eight pi. Sorry. Sorry, we want one by eight pi. Uh, which is no 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 no. I want uh, what I actually want is h z h of zero is equal to minus log z. Just the holomorphic part. Yeah. Oh, no. Which will work with alpha prime equals two, because this is z and then there's okay, a z bar. Okay, that's just the holomorphic. But we just take the holomorphic part. So we want alpha prime equals two. So we have one over h pi. One over h pi. Okay. So this is the normalization uh, that we will usually use when we're dealing with just abstract free bosons. Okay, which of course is just a matter of absorbing a field redefinition of this x. It's no physics in it, right? Unless it's compact. But you know, I'm just dealing with a chiral algebra, with the chiral half. So there's no compact. There's no zero mode in my discussion at the moment. Okay. So that's a more sophisticated discussion for for later. Yeah. Um, but even if it was compact, you could basically change the circle size. That will be changing the circle size. Circle size. So changing the periodicity. So you can always work with this normalization anyway. Okay. So uh, uh, fine. Now I want to argue that the theory of this H um, is, or at least the chiral algebra of the theory of this H is the same as the theory of psi and psi bar. Okay? More precise, so let's start as follows. Consider um, the object e to the power i h of z. Uh, I will also look at e to the power minus i h of z. Okay? And I want to look at the uh, uh, OPE algebra. I want to look at the operator product expansion built <coughs> between any, uh, between elements of these. Okay. Now I'm going to use the formula we developed last semester. So what we did, if you remember, was we had e to the power i h of z times e to the power, for instance, let's do minus i h of z. Um, so suppose I want to put this at minus z. Oh, I'll put it at zero. Okay, 
this was equal to something which we'll write down in the moment times normal order to that same object here. This conformal normal order e to the power i h of z e to the power minus i h of 0. Because it's normal order now you can treat it as numbers and do Taylor expansion and whatever. But the interesting thing was in this factor behind and uh, uh, the thing that came in the factor behind was uh, uh, the um, i <coughs> exponential of i with minus i sub plus uh, h of z h of 0 two point function. <laughs> One way of remembering why this was the factor uh, was, yeah, but one, one quick way of checking is just do a Taylor expansion. So there will be a term here which is ihz, and another term here is minus ih0. When you take, you will get the two point function of this, and that will be the first term in expanding this object. So just to remember, we know that it's a, this structure, just to, to get the number uh, quickly, uh, it's a quick way to check by Taylor. Free for the free field theory. Okay. Now, sorry? You can take derivatives, you're asking? No, if it, if it was just, just the, if the operator was just e to the power ihz and e to the power ih0. If if there was some complicated function of h, it would be some f f uh, functional derivatives and so on. But in this case, it's exactly this formula. Yeah, the functional derivative is very simple. It's a Gaussian thing. It's a Gaussian thing. Right. Right, this was, as you say, it came from the functional derivative formula. But in the particular case of exponentials, it's particularly simple. <coughs> okay, now this h of z, h of 0, we have seen is minus log z, okay, and minus log z, exponential of minus log z is 1 by z. So we get 1 by z times normal ordered e to the pi h of z minus i h of 0. The thing to note is that it's 1 by z, that the path that is singular, now this thing has a Taylor series expansion. Every term, every non-trivial term in the Taylor series expansion uh, is regular. But the path that is the singularity is the term that was just one here. So this was the singular part was one by z. Okay. Now what about e to the pi h of z, e to the pi i h of zero, where we put the same signs here. Now it's the same calculation. Exactly. We'll put a plus sign here, and uh, uh, this minus log z will become a plus log z. Okay, and so we will get z times whatever. No singularity. No singularity, and starts out at order z. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, similarly, e to the power minus i h of z times e to the power <coughs> minus i h of zero also starts out at order z and goes on. Okay? So we notice that this object, this e to the power i h z, uh, e to the power i h z and e to the power minus i, e to the power i h and e to the power minus i h have an interesting OP algebra. Okay, the uh, product of i h with e to the power minus i h is 1 by z plus regular <coughs> and the product of uh, i h with i h is z and regular uh, is z times the Taylor series expansion. Product of minus i h with minus i h is, uh, <coughs> is, one, is uh, uh, also z times the Taylor series exp expansion. Now, I want you to notice that this is exactly the same algebra 
as that between psi and psi bar. Okay. We had psi of z psi bar of zero went like one by z plus regular. We also had, you know, similarly the other way around. Now psi of z psi of zero had no no singularity, and therefore was equal to just normal ordered psi of z <coughs> psi of zero. Yeah, this was the right thing to say. This is what was confusing me last time. Within the normal order that uh, my manipulation would have been correct. Okay, now by normal order, one of the terms is just normal order psi zero square, the first term. So the term that's order one is zero. And therefore, this is also order z. Similarly, psi bar of z, psi bar of zero is order z. Okay? So these two guys have, um, uh, these two guys have exactly the same kind of, uh, kind of algebra. Now, <coughs> notice that, uh, now, suppose I wanted to know, suppose I wanted to know what I could say about the Suppose I'm on the plane, and I want to determine the correlation functions of uh, m insertions of e to the power i epsilon h, where epsilon is plus minus 1. m insertions of uh, these basic uh, algebra elements that we were interested in. Okay? More precisely, I'll take two m insertions. m of them will be e to the power i uh, i h and, uh, and uh, uh, m of them will be e to the power minus i h. Okay? And I want the vacuum expectation value of that object. So the thing I want to compute is uh, e to the power i epsilon one, epsilon 1 h of z 1 e to the power i epsilon 2 h of z 2 e to the power i epsilon 2 m uh, H of Z two. Exactly, because of momentum conservation. What would have been called momentum conservation had H been a space time scalar field. Shift symmetry. Exactly. Okay, we'd get zero unless this was the case. So we don't want uh, uh, we don't want to uh, consider that case. That's why we uh, uh, we. We look at the case where it's where it's non trivial. Now let's see. Let's first try to guess. You know, we could calculate this answer. We could calculate this answer using this Baker Campbell Hausdorff uh, formula, this, this formula that we developed last time by uh, rewriting in terms <laughs> of uh, normal ordered products and so on. But what I'm going to try to do, and you'll see that the answer we get is basically that answer. But what I'm going to try to do uh, is try to take a more abstract point of view. I'm going to try to guess the answer and check <coughs> uh, and then ask whether my guess had to have been correct. Okay? See, now, one thing I know about the answer is this, that when any two z's come together, Suppose I take zij, then this thing must behave like zij to the power epsilon i epsilon j. If the two epsilons are different, they must behave like z i one by zij. If the two epsilons are the same, they must behave like zij. That's what we've checked here. Okay? So when you go very close, when z, the z's are very, very near to each other, okay, when the z's are very near to each other, Okay, then uh, uh, the, uh, the, the correlator must behave like this. Okay, 
So this tells you that there must be a, a factor, a, a term for every pair i and j of this form i not equal to j. This must be there. And then maybe there's something else for the various zis. Okay, but let's see. Um, now, whatever this is, is something that should have no singularities when any z's come together. Because we've already dealt with all the singularities. So this, <coughs> this, this object must be a completely polynomial function in its arguments because it's analytic and it has no singularities. Now all polynomial functions that are non-trivial blow up at infinity. Yeah. Okay, but this is a correlation function of positive dimension operators. So we separate them very much. The co correlator should die at infinity. Uh, so the only possibility basically is that this thing is a constant. Let's do a sanity check that this is the right answer. Okay? Uh, let's do a sanity check that this is the right answer. All, all pairs i not equal to j. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right, pairs. Uh, no, did, did just, you, Uh, no. No, no, in, no, no, there has to be, for every pair, yeah. there is such a term. Yes. One, two, and one, three is a term. What? Yeah. One, two, and one, three is a different term, and they will all appear. Yeah, but uh, then that will be the sum, that will be summed over, not. No, no, producted over. This, the, there should be no term in the correlation function that does not have the singularity when one goes to three. Okay, this is the claim that this thing here, uh, you see I'm not trying to do weak theorem or anything like that. I'm just writing down an object uh, that has all the singularities. Okay, so in fact, just to do a sanity check, let's check the, di let's check the scaling dimensions of this. Um, uh, let's check the scaling dimensions of this object. How many terms are there? Okay, firstly, let's compute the scaling dimension of each of these quantities. You guys remember that the scaling dimension of an operator in the free boson theory was e to the power my, was delta, we had minus. delta was e equal to minus alpha, alpha prime k squared by four. Plus, yeah, I'm <laughs> plus <laughs> alpha prime k squared by 4. So alpha prime is 2. So we have k squared by 2. Our epsilons are always, k is always plus or minus 1. So each of these has dimension plus minus half. What? Uh, just all each of these have dimension half. Yeah, which of course also nicely matches the fact that it's going to agree with the fermions which have dimension half. Okay. Now, what we had was m e to the power i h's and m e to the power minus i h's. Okay, so in this product, there are some terms that are e to the power i h's with e to the power i h's. How many such terms are there? It's m into m minus 1 by 2. Similarly, there are some terms which are e to the power minus i h's with e to the power minus i h's. Same number. Each of these gives a factor of z12. Yes. Okay? So the, I'm going to count homogeneity. Hmm. So this much comes in the numerator. We have yeah. Yeah. homogeneity z to the power this yes. minus the number of terms that were e to the power i h's and e to the power minus i h's. 
which was minus m square. OK? Now the m square, m square cancel, leaving e to the uh, z to the power, oh, so 1 by z to the power m, which is perfect because we had two m operators, each of dimension half. OK? So literally, this product of terms, it's such a simple answer. This product of terms is the final answer for the correlation functions of these. Actually, if you worked it out by our rearranging into normal order, you get exactly this. It's a nice exercise. It's almost obvious because <coughs> you can go term by term. You can go the first one with the second, then whatever you get with the third, then whatever you get with the fourth, and you'll generate each of these products. For the most singular term, it will be a product of the whole thing. And then what, <laughs> I, what is left behind will be normal order of something. Yeah. And the expectation value of that will be one because e to the power i something. OK? But I wanted to give you the argument this way. Because once I've given you the argument this way, the argument applies also to the correlation function of m psi and m psi bars. Because all I used in my argument was the singularity structure of the OP and the zero structure of the OP. OK? And one can explicitly check. You know, it's a free theory. One can explicitly check by doing various weak, by doing all the weak contractions. That's what you would do in that case. You would do the weak contractions. There'd be many weak contractions. Then you'd have to sum all the terms together. Once you do the sum, you'll end up with this formula. OK? So, what we have concluded, just on general grounds, just from the basically the um, singularities and zeros of OPs, the fact that these two things have obeyed the same singularity zero structure in OP, basically was enough to tell you that the correlation functions of any string of these operators were the same. Excellent. So this. No matter what the order is, and that's. I mean. This <laughs> Um, now, there could be a sign depending on it. The order might. Yeah. Uh, there, there, we've, there's some number we've not kept track of. Hmm. That number might depend, in fact, will depend on the ordering. Hmm. Okay? But uh, uh, apart from that, it's just necessarily the same. Now, you may, wa you may ask, what about the actual. Uh, um, uh, in fact, even the dependence of that number on the ordering is obvious once you have the answer. Because you know, if you take change two, suppose you suppose that <coughs> you do it from left to right and some number. Then if you change two of them, you can see how that changes because it's precisely the flip term associated with that flip. Yeah. So uh, so there's just an so the the number the value of the number, de the dependence on ordering also has to agree on both sides. Just the overall constant number that could differ. And that then is a matter of normalization. Okay? So basically, we've already convinced ourselves that these two are the, th the same <coughs> theories, at least in the sector, where you have, uh, at least in the sector that is generated by arbitrary number of insertions of psi and psi bar. <laughs> but, you see, arbitrary number of insertions of psi and psi bar generate basically everything, at least. I mean, yeah, that will generate the whole uh, partition function. Exactly. Uh, generate basically everything because you see the whole, all the operators of the theory are derivatives on psi's and derivatives on psi bars. And by doing OP, changing the distance between things, you'll generate all of them intuitively clear. Okay? So at least if we don't do anything funny, we will soon start doing funny things. At least if you don't do anything funny, you're getting the whole Hilbert space on this side. On that side, basically, the, the f getting many size <coughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, uh, on this side, you know, the various operators that you can get will be e to the power i m h and e to the power minus i n h and then various derivatives of h. All of those will also be generated by arbitrary OPAs of this. Okay? Uh, so anything that, since all these, these, these correlation functions agree, anything that appears in the operator product expansion of two or more of these objects, their correlation functions also have to agree. Because it's impossible otherwise that the whole correlate function. So this whole sector, the sector that is generated by repeated operator product expansions of e to the power i h, e to the power minus i h, uh, is identical to the sector generated by size and cybers. Now, just to make that last thing a little less abstract, let's work out an example. Okay, so consider the following. Consider the expansion of psi, uh, let's say, e to the power i h of z with e to the power minus i h of, of minus z. And let's consider this expansion not just to leading order in, uh, in, <coughs> in singularity, but to a couple of subleading orders. <coughs> so we have uh, uh, already seen that this is 1 over 2z. That was the z yeah. e to the power h, z, uh, 2 because now I put z and minus z. And then we will have normal order e to the power i h of z minus i h of minus z. Now that I've got this normal order, I can just pretend that this is a number and perform whatever manipulations I would like on this number. Okay, so let's do that. At leading order, of course, that is, so that is equal to 1 over 2z into 1 plus. Now the next order is Taylor, given by Taylor expansion. So that is 2 uh, 2i del h of 0. Over, uh, times, over z. times z over, yes, over 2z, right. Yeah, that's 2z is outside, yeah. Two. And then there is whatever we get at next order. Now, next order, the Taylor expansion will vanish. Because uh, in the Taylor expansion, up here will vanish because uh, it's an whatever odd function of z. Okay, but uh, in expanding this exponential, we can take the next term. Okay, so that will give us plus half <laughs> into two i the whole thing square z square del h of zero the whole thing square. Okay, so now let's simplify this as 1 by 2z plus i del h, uh, and 2 has gone of 0, plus now we have, there's lots of 2s around here, so 4 divided by 2 divided by 2, so that's, the 2 has gone, and uh, there's an overall z, there's a minus 1, good, there's a minus 1, uh, and we have del h, the whole thing, square. Now, I want to do the same expansion for psi cyber. That is an easy expansion. Okay? between z and minus z, sorry. Psi of z, psi bar of minus z. So this, once again, is 1 over 2z. That's the singular term. But then everything else is in the normal order. 
plus normal ordered uh, psi of z psi bar of minus z. This is the only singular piece was, was that object. And then the Taylor, is, uh, Taylor series uh, expand to this object. So, um, so let's Taylor series expand it. So first term would be psi 0, psi bar 0. So this goes like 1 by 2 z plus normal order psi of 0, psi bar 0, not 0 because it's psi psi bar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, plus, and then there are terms where we Taylor expand either this or we Taylor expand this. So plus z into del psi psi bar plus uh, psi del psi bar. All at zero. I'm not writing that. Uh, plus or minus? Oh, good point. So this one has a <laughs> minus. This term has a minus. Uh, yeah. Psi and psi bar are sort of an equal footing. And so del psi psi bar plus del psi bar psi. Hmm. This is the U1 current. And this is the stress tensor. This is the shift symmetry current. And this is the stress tensor. <laughs> OK. So you see, what we argued abstractly five, 10 minutes ago was that the only way all correlation functions of strings of size and strings of psi bars can agree with each, with all correlation functions of strings of e to the power ih's and e to the power minus ih's is if the correlation functions of the operators that appear in the OP <coughs> separately agree with each other, okay? So which, may, which basically gives us a dictionary to identify composite operators. So now, this is an example where we're working out this dictionary. We're working out that this operator is to be identified with this operator. That is, given our observation of agreement of correlation functions of these basic operators, the correlators of these two operators have to agree. <coughs> right? And similar, oh sorry, I, I, sorry. <laughs> and similarly, the correlation functions of these operators have to agree. Now, this one is particularly important <laughs> because it tells you that the two theories have the same stress tensor that the natural stress tensor, that these two theories agree with each other in a way that maps the canonical stress tensor of the fermions to the canonical stress tensor of the bosons. Um, not surprising, given that it's these canonical set stress tensors that make both theories C equals half. Uh, but satisfying. Uh, I'm going to contrast the, okay, if, if you think this statement is more or less trivial, we'll see, you'll see why I made it in 10 minutes. I, I mean, you know, free theories often have parameter worth stress tensors. You can sometimes construct many different stress tensors within a free theory, as we will see. Okay? <laughs> By some improvement uh, term? By an improvement term from the point of view of the action or, uh, 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 yeah, also an improvement term, some, some total derivative kind. Right. <laughs> you, you'll, you'll see. Uh, I was, uh, just yes. wondering about something. For is it uh, possible to uh, write this as a duality transformation between the fundamental fields, I mean, which is possibly non-local, uh, so that uh, we can just go from one to another? Yeah, so the map is quite explicit, right? At, at the level of uh, the Lagrangian. Oh, at the level of the Lagrangian. Firstly, we know what the map is. Psi is e to the power i h, mm -hmm. and psi bar is e to the power minus i h. Mm -hmm. Okay? You want to do a path integral manipulation. Now you want to, at the level of path integral, yeah, yes. can you do this transformation? This I don't know how to do. 
I do not know how to uh, yeah that is an, an interesting idea, but I do not know how to you know start with let us say the fermionic path integral and do a path integral manipulation that changes it into the bosonic path integral. Well, I suppose it must be possible. Uh, in terms of code, but that is like the I, the answer. He wants to see it, he wants to see you know without, without knowing details. Uh, <coughs> well, you know the two, two things about, firstly I do not really know how to do this. Uh, but secondly, exactly what you want <coughs> is only precise once I make, you know, what I am doing so far is dealing with a chiral algebra, just dealing with the chiral half of the theory. Mm. I need to give you a full theory so to be defined by a well defined path integral. I have not yet done that. Uh, but still, that is possible to do, and I do not know how to do this. Um, it probably is possible, just give me a minute. Uh, Yeah, it probably is possible, but I do not I don't know how to do it. In fact, you know, you can see like the partition function of these two theories are the same, but to see that they are the same is quite non trivial. It is like some theta function identity that makes them the same, which already tells you that it would not be that simple because the partition function comes directly from let us say one loop determinants on both sides. One loop determinants and the fermion side some some winding stuff. Uh, the boson side some winding stuff. Uh, I don't know how to do it. It would, would be it would be interesting. Oh. Okay. Hmm. I'm sure somebody has done done something like this. This is too old and too too simple for somebody not to have managed somehow. But I've never seen it. Uh, <coughs> it's probably not very elegant because otherwise it would have been famous. Yeah. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, good question. I'll see if I can look something up. Uh, okay. Um, fine. Say, say again. Uh, okay. So now, once again, you know, really to talk of the partition function, we have to put left and right movers together and so. Both of them. Yes. But. The, the, if you put both of them, then the partition function is invariant on the torus. Yes, yes. So, yes. But if you look at one part, it will transform in. <coughs> yes. Other part will be concentric. Yes. So, when you take the fermionic partition function. Yes. Fermion side chiral part, anti chiral part. Yes. Both of the chiral part, anti chiral part. Yes. Uh, in fact, let us do it since you are asking, you guys are asking. It is the algebra is simple, it is just to see that there is the same as some theta function identity. Uh, so, let us see. What is the partition function from the point of view of the fermions? The partition function from the point of view of the fermions is very simple. It is, uh, let us say we are computing. Um, let us say we are computing trace e to the power i uh, uh, oh, what, what, what do we know, how do we normally say it, tau to the pi l naught, trace of tau to the pi l naught. Let us say that is the quantity we want to compute. <coughs> we want to compute this quantity where l naught runs over the spectrum of all operators that lies in this, chi this, this chiral algebra. Okay. So, what are these operators? Well, all the derivatives you can make on either psi or psi bar and products of them. They are fermionic, so you cannot put two of them together. Okay. So, it is basically just Fermi statistics. Okay. So, what you will have is, is product of 
Uh, product of, uh, now we, we are just doing the chiral part, so th there's only one kind of derivative, just, just, just uh, del z. Uh, so suppose we've got the operator which is del m of psi, and there's another operator which is del m of psi bar, and we just take products of these guys unrestrictedly, okay, except that you can't have more than one of them. So we have product m is equal to um, 0 to infinity, okay, uh, and each of these operators now will have what weight? This will have uh, m plus half, so um, 1 <coughs> plus tau to the power m plus half, and then this thing will be squared because we've got the same thing from Tauga. Correct. I'm just looking at whatever you get in this algebra sector. All the operators you can build by taking products of psi and psi bar and their OPs. That automatically at this point puts you into this NS sector. Okay, so we, we can do something more complicated, but at the moment I'm just doing this. Uh, is this clear? Uh, fine. On the other hand, uh, what is trace tau to the pile naught from the point of view of the bosons? Now the bosons are a bit different, right? Because what are the various operators? You can have <laughs> e to the power i m h or e to the power minus imh and then these can be multiplied by derivatives of h and the derivatives are uh, bosonic, h itself has dimension 0, I mean so derivatives of h, uh, more precisely the m derivatives of h have dimension m, okay. So you see this will be the following it will be sum over m is equal to minus infinity to infinity e to the uh, tau to the power. Now e to the power i m h has uh, weight m square by 2. So m square by 2 multiplied by product n is equal to <coughs> 0 to infinity, 1 over 1 minus tau to the power m, n, <coughs> 1 to infinity, because h itself is not an operator. Now, I, you know what is confusing, maybe confusing is what people normally call this, people normally call this 2, two pi i tau, right? Yeah, let me just call that, let me call it Z because it's irritating to keep writing. Uh, is Z confusing? Some, give me some other letter. Uh, zeta. Q, Q, they call it Q, fine. Q. Yeah, the formulas were looking wrong because it's normally written in terms of this Q, where Q normally people write as H perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it is a modular property. Oh, oh, it is some, you know, I think it's basically some Poisson resummation. Yeah, Poisson resummation for m square by 2 pi. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, just let's check for a moment that these two are the same by expanding to a few orders. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Let's take this. There's one, then you have uh, um, plus two q to the power half plus now you will have uh, 
Uh, Q squared, oh, sorry, Q in a unique way because, uh, you know, what was this? This was 1 plus Q to the half into 1 plus Q to the half into 1 plus Q to the 3 halves into 1 plus Q to the 3 halves and so on. Let's not go beyond that order. The only way to get Q is multiply this with this. Okay. Um, so we get Q in a unique way, and then uh, what is the next power we get? The next power is 3 halves plus Q to 2 Q to the 3 halves. And then you will get a Q squared in, th Q squared in some interesting ways, right? Uh, four ways. Yeah, the two choices here yeah. and two choices here. Yeah. Okay, let's compare with this. Okay, so in this sum, we had one that was from vacuum plus q to the half plus two q to the half that was m is equal to plus minus one plus uh, um, m is plus minus two gives q square, right? 2q square into <coughs> 1 plus uh, q plus q square, that's the n equals 1 term, into 1 plus q square. That's the n equals 2 term. Since I'm stopping at q square, I don't need more. <coughs> okay, and now let <coughs> <coughs> yeah, let's check it. So 1 matches, of course, q to the half matches, of course. Um, note that in both sides there's no, uh, yeah, q matches by itself, good. q to the 3 halves is q to the half times q, so that matches. Uh, now let's get q squared, that will be a non-trivial guy. That's 2q squared plus Plus 2q squared, exactly. So 4 matches and so on. It's a true identity, it's some crazy thing. No doubt there's some modular, I, I don't know what, what, what goes behind it, but it's a true identity and uh, I'm sure if one ha works hard, one can prove it by some Poisson summation. But you see that it's a non-trivial rearrangement of the spectrum. <laughs> Why does it start from n equals 1? Because you see, these operators here were the e to the power i m h's. And these operators here were the del n h's. And del 0 h, so just h, is not an operator. Yeah, yeah, you know, what is true is, is the following. Uh, something I have not emphasized, uh, because we keep dealing with the chiral half, but e to the power i h by itself is not, uh, is not really a local operator. Uh, precisely because uh, h with e to the power i h is not single value. It's not mutually single valued. Okay? What this means is that e to the power ih is some operator that creates a cut. Okay? So what 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 on the other hand psi But then you you use plus psi decomposition of this operator. Should I tell that after? Well, all that this cut does is change some signs. So it doesn't doesn't uh, um, uh, and and th there was no issue within the sector generated by e to the pi h's. The issue came when we took h with it. Yes. Oh, okay. So what I'm saying is that in terms of, the, if you think of it as like a path integral of the fundamental field h, mm -hmm. then e to the pi h is not a local insert, 
not local in that sense. It is a local operator. Its correlation functions within its sector are perfectly well defined, as we've seen. We wrote, it, we wrote the answer down. Okay? But it's not local for the quote unquote fundamental field H. Okay? So that's I'm I'm saying this because of your question. Your question was, is this like strong weak coupling duality? So uh, what you probably mean is if I wrote down a path integral in terms of H and I wrote down a path integral in terms of psi, is there a strong weak coupling duality going on between these two path integrals? Both these are free theories, so I mean what we mean by strong weak is a bit unclear. But uh, 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 what, what is precise is that the operators that become, that become psi are not local from the point of view of the field H. People sometimes say they are solitonic operators, whatever that means. Okay? Um, <coughs> actually, condensed matter people understand this very clearly in their language. They have this thing called the jordan wigner transformation. Okay, where the operator psi, is the operator that becomes the fermion, explicitly has some spin flip operators running to infinity. You really explicitly see the cut and so on. <laughs> it's like a Wilson line attached to a, uh, an operator which basically is, is, is essential to, to turn the boson into a fermion. Okay? So in some sense, it is a strong weak coupling duality, like some quite complicated object from the bosonic side becomes a very elementary object on the fermionic side. <coughs> okay. Um, now, uh, uh, one more thing that may be useful is the following. Although we we we've been. Uh, as you were yeah, H with e to the pi H had, oh, you mean before, you're talking about something else now. I'm talking about when we were doing Raman sector and RR sector. Yes. Then on the plane, yeah. for one sector there was, uh, OP had half integer. Value. Yes, yes. So they have gone through their monogram exactly as you go around. Yes. For this two fermions, with either H and e to the pi H, they have this the Montreville monodromy for, for H, yes. for the field H. Yes, 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 yes. But you know, the field H was never an operator by itself. Yes. Okay. So this is just about some conceptual thing. However, what we are going to do is to look at various sectors of these theories, do funny boundary conditions in a moment. And then your question will become uh, clearer. Okay. At the moment, it's just in some fuzzy way, in some conceptual way. If there was an H, there isn't. Okay. Okay. Other questions, comments? <coughs> okay. Uh, fine. So, uh, I suppose uh, <coughs> this is what I wanted to say in the untwisted. Sectors, if I let me check if I missed out anything. Uh, okay. Now, I'm going to do something a little weirder. I'm going to do something a little weirder in my study of this uh, of this theory. Let us remember, and along the lines of what Indranil was saying. Let us remember that when we studied the fermions at the end of the last semester, um, we dealt with the Ramon sector and the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Okay. And uh, the, the Nebuchadnezzar sector was a sector which on the cylinder was anti-periodic, <coughs> whereas the Ramon sector on the cylinder was periodic. But once we mapped to the plane, because of the uh, z to the power half uh, factor, it, the Nebuchadnezzar sector became periodic on the plane and the Ramon sector became anti-periodic on the plane. <coughs> so, uh, you might also remember 
that the operators psi, psi bar, del psi, and so on, were all dual to states in the which sector? This is the bounded, this, this operator. These operators, the operators that we were dealing with just now. The, on the plane, the match operators are Nebuchadnezzar. Exactly. They were all dual to operators uh, in the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Just because, um, how does it come about? You see, so let's see. So we have, let's do the expansion. Psi is always expanded as sum over m, okay, 1 over z to the pi m plus half. Where z is the molding on the cylinder. Okay, in the Nebuchadnezzar sector, Z was a half integer moded on the cylinder. Therefore, M is half integer moded. Therefore, the effective moding here is integer moding. So we have psi M. Let's say we're in the NS sector. So Z M belongs to uh, M belongs to <coughs> integers. Now. Suppose I wanted to look at just the state dual to the operator psi. I want to check whether it belongs to the Nebuchadnezzar sector. It will belong to the Nebuchadnezzar sector if I can identify some creation operator on cylinder vacuum with these boundary conditions. That is that gives me the state. Okay. Now, okay. So let's do this as a quick exercise. <coughs> um, so let us let us uh, okay. Uh, let us remember. Um, let us remember. Uh, <coughs> so, wh uh, what we have is that the, the the full set of states in the uh, uh, in the Nebuchadnezzar sector will be created by acting with the creation operators for either psi or psi bar <coughs> on the vacuum. We were on the cylinder. M was half integer moded. There was no issue of zero modes. Okay. So the full Hilbert space is you can create with psi half, uh, psi minus half or psi minus three halves. Any collection of these. Similarly with psi bar, psi bar minus half, psi bar minus three halves. Any connection of these. Okay. So now uh, what do I want to show? I want to show that each of these states is going to be dual to one of these kind of operators. Okay, the basic intuition is that now this is just an integer power. So you do the Taylor series expansion here, and that will be the operator it will be dual to. Okay, let's let's see that basic intuition at work in a particular context. Let's look at the operator, for instance, psi that we were looking at here. We will check what the, uh, uh, what annihilates it and so on and identify the state. First let's do, uh, um, okay fine, let's, let's do that and then we'll give the rough argument which will also give the same answer. Okay, um, okay, so, uh, um, so, uh, so, uh, so we, 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 we've got this operator psi of 0, then what we do is to take psi m and write this as z to the power m minus half psi of z dz, there's some 2 pi i's and so on which we forget about and then <coughs> psi m bar is equal to z to the pi m minus half psi bar of z, dz, okay. 
Okay. Now we act with psi m and psi m bar separately on this state and see what we get. Let us do it with psi m bar. Okay. So we act with psi m bar on the state psi which is equal to integral uh, z to the power m minus half psi bar of z psi of 0 dz. <coughs> then we use the op. Okay, so we get z to the power m minus half, uh, so minus 3 by 2. Hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, we get z to the power m minus 3 by 2 and uh, uh, that's the that's the uh, sing that's the singular piece. That's sorry. So let's write it as z to the y minus half <coughs> into one by z plus. That's all the regular stuff, right? Uh, th th there's the regular stuff, which is um, uh, plus power series, plus regular. It's called. Yeah, now that's the key point. Because m is half integer, <coughs> some will be 0 and some will not. So when m is equal to half, precisely? Exactly. So when m is equal, firstly, when this guy is negative. m greater than half, then you are in trouble. It's 0. Ha, huh. uh, exactly. So when m is less than or equal to minus half, in general, it's non-zero. Okay, yeah. Yes. Because from the regular because piece. it can hit the regular piece. Uh, okay. Uh, in fact, is not equal to zero. For m equals half. Um, m equals half. Uh, we get one. M greater, yeah, up to, yeah. <laughs> greater than, uh, uh, greater than half. We get zero. Okay. Now you see these were destruction operators. Yeah, so is it psi minus half? Exactly. So this is psi minus half on vacuum. Uh, you can confirm it. You can confirm also by doing with the psi psi op. What you will find is that one creation operator that should have given you non-zero will actually give you, give you zero because psi psi op starts with z. Okay, so you will find that psi my uh, you know psi minus half on this state was zero, as it should be because psi minus half squares to zero. Okay, so you can confirm that. So the basic point here was that because this expansion here was in integer powers, the state was in the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Uh, the, these regular kind of things were in the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, let's let's just just leave it at that. So the Nebuchadnezzar sector, the, everything that we've been talking about so far, the sector we've been talking about is the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Okay. In fact, it's all of the Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> But we are interested in more than the ne in studying string theory. We are interested in more than the Nebuchadnezzar sector for the fermions. We are also interested in the Ramon sector. Actually, um, in the study of orbifolds and certain compactifications of string theory, we are sometimes interested in more general sectors. Okay, um, so for that reason, we want to see. And actually, the <coughs> the, I the ideas behind Bose. <coughs> Bosonization are most useful in the Ramon sector, where it's hard to deal directly with the fermionic theory, but as I will show you, easy to deal with the bosonic, the bosonized theory. Because it will have also some branch cuts. Uh, because you see the operators dual to states in the Ramon sector, what could they be in fermionic language? 
You see, in fermionic language, we've just written down all operators you can imagine. And they were all in the NS sector. So there's one-to-one -one correspondence between every operator you can think of. And states in the NS sector. But if we want to scatter something in the Ramon sector, we need to find the operator dual to it by the basic principles of our scattering. Okay. But uh, you know, what can it be? Conformal field theory people are very clever. They know how to invent abstract operators. Operators such that whose basic property is that when psi goes around it, it picks up a minus sign or something like that. Or, you know, picks up some phase. <coughs> um, yeah. And one can work in this language. But you know, that requires a certain degree of cleverness. <coughs> and uh, it's sort of irritating. You know, you can't think like like we like to think, right? We contract. You can't think. You have to think more like a mathematician thinks for, for such things. Okay? So if you have an explicit construction of these operators, that's very useful. Now if I asked you, what could another operate? On the other hand, look at the boson the bosons. In the bosons, we also just enumerated all the operators that were in this special sector. It was derivatives on H's, okay, that's more or less everything. And then e to the power i m h, where m was an integer. Now you, you could ask, what could another possible bosonic operator be? And all of you will tell, uh, tell me, what about e to the power i k h, where k is not an integer? And indeed, these will be the kind of operators that will be dual <coughs> to uh, Ramon sector or funny twisted sectors in the fermionic theory. So what I'm saying is this, that <coughs> when you look at the chiral algebra of the fermion, what we seem to have dealt with seems to have exhausted everything that we can simply write down. To enlarge the chiral algebra can be done, but it's not obvious how to proceed. You have to be clever. On the other hand, on the boson side, we look. What we're looking at is obviously a subalgebra of the chiral algebra of bosons. Because who asked us to restrict ourselves, our attention to e to the power i m h, where m was an integer? We did that because that's what matched the fermions. But clearly, there's a bigger algebra in which it sits. Real, I mean. It could be any, any real number. Yeah. So we can use that for good effect. This is going to be one of our prime uses of bosonization. To enlarge the operator algebra of the fermions in a very natural way. Okay? <coughs> Anything else? In fact, that's what I'm going to, going to work out now. Okay, any uh, questions? <coughs> Some m is an element of z plus half, right? Ah, z plus, z plus half, yes. Thank you, sorry. Yes. Ramond is half integer, and that is of primary interest to constructing the superstring. But um, as Sunil asked, uh, well, what we're going to do for a moment, since, since it's as easy, is to generalize more broadly. Uh, so let's start. <laughs> Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, here we have not used all the operators as you have said. Yeah, we only we were very careful. We only used those operators that were generated by products of e to the power i h. Okay. That's why we got that sum. Right? Had we wanted every operator, we would have got an integral, and we would have got a continuum and a divergence. Right? <laughs> is is this clear? Now, I want to emphasize one thing. <coughs> now, we want to, you were saying enlarge means we want to find the corresponding operators for this other operators that you're looking for, i, k, where k is here. Yeah, you'll, the yeah. you'll see what we do. But there's something I want to emphasize here that is tricky and confusing uh, and you should be aware of. That is, that you can enlarge an operator algebra in some formal way does not mean that every operator in that algebra will appear in a particular theory. 
a theory of interest may restrict to some subalgebra of these operators. In fact, the a theory of interest may be forced to restrict to some subalgebra of operators. Because, you see, one of the problems, let's, let's start this way. <coughs> Also, yes, and modular invariance might be in trouble if you include too many operators. Yes. <laughs> so, exactly, it's such, co such considerations that will decide finally what your theory actually has. Okay, but so let, let's, let's just remind you of the point. Suppose I have e to the pi kx, and let's call it kh, times e to the pi k prime h. Let's take this at z and this at 0. Then this goes like z to the power k k prime times whatever. <coughs> <coughs> okay? In general, if k and k prime are some arbitrary rational or irrational numbers, this is on a strange power of z. And so this operator by itself is not mutually local with respect to this operator. Because it has a non trivial moment. Because what does the correlation function mean? What is the correlator? This guy located here, this guy located here. If I take it around and bring it, I get a different answer. What does it mean? Correlation functions have to be single valued. Okay? Now, notice that. Were we to have the anti-holomorphic part as well, and we did h plus h bar, h plus h bar, <laughs> you would have this for the holomorphic piece, but z bar to the power k k prime for the anti-holomorphic piece, and now it's perfectly well behaved. Okay, so e to the power i k x, the full operator x, or e to the power i k h, the full operator h, perfectly well defined. Mutually local for different values of k. Okay? But if you try to make operators like e to the power i k1h, e to the power i k2h bar for arbitrary k and k, k1 and k2, it'll make no sense. <coughs> There's no theory in which all of these operators are simultaneously implemented. So there's some cut of chiral of chiral algebras give you possibilities. And then the theory will have to put some, pick some cut to satisfy various other requirements. <coughs> Neutral locality, which is very tightly tied to modular invariance. Okay, so uh, <coughs> we will see these principles come up again and again over the next few lectures as we understand these ideas better. Okay. But, uh, but but for now, let uh, thank you. I, I, I'll, if I'm really, in, if I really need it, I'll ask you. Thank you. Uh, uh, <coughs> okay. So now let us let us go back to the cylinder. Uh, let us go back to the cylinder, and. Um, you know, uh, let's say sigma is a coordinate in the cylinder. And uh, suppose we work in a sector where psi of 2 pi is e to the power i <coughs> 2 pi i nu times psi of nu. But psi bar of 2 pi is equal to e to the power minus 2 pi i nu times psi bar of 0. I knew. What? I knew. I knew. I knew it, yes. Uh, no, no, no. I knew where of a charge. You want charge. I'm saying, uh, 
You're, you're, you're going to give me the uh, state uh, operator due to, ah, now I know what you're doing. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the vacuum of this will be to the value of h. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, now, now I understand what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, it will, it will be that, e to the value of h. But let's study that slowly uh, for the vacuum. Okay. Now, first, the first question you could ask is why do we twist in this, this way? Why is it allowed to twist in such a strange way? And uh, why if I've twisted in a strange way, why do I have to coordinate the twisting of psi bar with the twisting of psi in this particular fashion? And the answer, of course, is that the action, relatedly the stress tensor, is a product of psi and psi bar. And you want that to be single valued as you go over your cylinder. So you'll allow yourself, thank you, Panya. So you'll allow yourself uh, um, funny boundary conditions of psi, but not for psi psi bar. Okay, not for the action and the Lagrangian, the things that you know you need to deal with. That's why now we in, in the early part of this course will only deal with the cases nu equals zero and nu equals one. Let me just check the conventions. Oh, sorry, nu equals zero and nu equals half. Um, uh, the uh, uh, nu equals zero is the Ramon sector. Nu equals half is the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, this, is this is on the cylinder. Yes. Uh, okay. What I'm going to try to do <coughs> uh, what I'm going to try to do is to try to see if I can make uh, um, find the <coughs> operators dual to all the states in this quantization. Okay, that's my goal. Is, is this clear? Now, as we said in fermionic language, there are no obvious operators. We have to, we'll have to invent some new abstract operators. They're called twist operators. <coughs> Defined by the monodromy of psi as it goes around one of these operators. Okay? But in bosonic language, we have the hope that it can be just something simple and explicit. So what we're going to do is to try to find simple bosonic constructions for the operators dual to the states in this sector. So let us proceed. Um, what we do is, as usual, we do the mode expansion. So psi in the new sector is equal to sum over psi m, z by m plus half, where m belongs to z plus mu. Okay, and psi bar in the new sector is equal to sum over psi bar m by z to pi m plus half, where m belongs to <coughs> z minus nu. Nu equal to zero is Ramon. This is this is this is here on the cylinder. Uh, no, now I've gone to the plane. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, plus half here. Yeah. Right. So this was on the cylinder. This is now on the plane. I'm just doing the same, the usual thing. I've gone to the plane, done the mode expansion. Okay. And but the fact that on the cylinder m was in z plus nu is reflected there. Okay. So the first question I'm going to ask is this. <coughs> what is the vacuum of this theory, of the cylinder theory? Well, the vacuum of the cylinder theory is the state that is annihilated by, let us suppose, uh, nu is just half a zero. No, nu could be anything at the moment. Okay? We will eventually be most interested in half a zero. But let's take any number, I for definiteness, let it vary continuously in your head from 0 to half. 
it also takes 0 to 1, but there is uh, when we need to think of a number, we will think of it between 0 to half because then maybe some shifts we will have to do when it is between half and 1. I mean, going <coughs> to half, uh, generates uh, pretty much? Pretty much everything up to some psi psi bar flip. Yeah. Exactly. So, it generates everything essentially. So, you just generalize that m belongs to z plus half to m z plus new. Uh, m belongs to z plus z plus half to m, m belongs to z plus new. And that is because this was if you took so modes on the cylinder, you mode expanded it, you would expand it as e to the power i m plus new sigma, right. So, it is not just a jet, I mean it is <laughs> logical. Yes. Okay. Now, so suppose, uh, so which more? What, so, what, what, how is the vacuum defined? The vacuum is defined such that every positive psi, every po okay, let's let's say new whatever it is is less than one. <coughs> let's say zero to one, less than but less than modulus one. So, a, so and we will call these m's. So, so we have psi m plus new where m is now, okay, I am changing notation, let us call it n <coughs> plus nu. These quantities m are all of the form n plus nu, where n is an integer, okay. So, for n greater than equal to 0, <laughs> psi of n plus nu and 0 should be equal to 0. And si similarly, Psi, now, what about psi bar? Psi bar is always of the form n minus nu on 0, should be 0, and this is for n greater than or equal to 1. Right? Because anything that is positive. <coughs> is creation? Uh, sorry, is annihilation and sh so should annihilate the vacuum, whereas anything that is uh, uh, negative okay, is creation and need not, in fact, will not annihilate the, the vacuum. Is this clear? So, we want, a, uh, we want this to be true. Now, we do not yet know what the operator dual to this, this state is. Let us call it O. We have got this O inserted here. But we know that we want this to be true, and we want the statements not to be true when n do not obey these inequalities. And then the commutative is in between psi n plus nu and psi bar n minus nu. Correct, 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 okay. correct. Right. What? I want the operator dual to the state. The state is whatever it is. It's the abstract state is defined by this. I want the operator dual to that state. Okay. So now I'll process this information. Okay. So. <coughs> we had these relations. So, we get that uh, z to the power, now we will write n plus nu minus half, okay, psi of z o of 0, this integral should be equal to 0 for n greater than or equal to 0 but should not be equal to 0 for n less than or equal to minus 1. Right? Okay. Also, we have z to the power uh, um, z to the power 
n minus nu minus half psi bar of z <coughs> of 0 should be equal to 0 for n greater than equal to 1 not be equal to 0 n less than equal to 0. We want to find the operator the operators O of 0 that have this property. Now we've already we've already correct. Exactly. Then you get a minus nu which cancels that. Exactly. 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 So as Indranil has indicated, we've already told I've already told you what our strategy is going to be. Our strategy is going to be to find an explicit expression for O in bosonic language. So what we do is first thing we do is to translate this into its bosonic version. So this was e to the power i h of z. And <coughs> minus i h of z. Now, <coughs> suppose we take O to be e to the power i nu h. Maybe we get the, got the sign wrong. We'll fix it in a moment. <laughs> if we have, suppose we take that. Okay. Then, what will we get from this OP? Okay, this OP will give us Z to the power nu. Uh, whereas this OP would give us Z to the power minus nu. So we wanted a minus nu. So I'll take Z O is equal to minus I I nu H. Yes. So z to the power minus nu and z to the power nu. Okay. <coughs> now that nu. Uh, so say we take uh, yeah. So that z to the power minus nu will cancel this. Ah. Uh, in fact, we will want nu minus half. Sorry. Give, give, give me, give me a moment. Uh, this new, so yeah. yeah. This. So want new I want to cancel minus this part basically. Minus, uh, new minus, half. minus new minus half. Yeah. Minus. Let's check if that works. Uh, this will get rid of this. Wouldn't that be uh, an i without the minus before it? Because that's the way you would. You want to, you don't want me to put minus here? I mean, that's how you would get uh, the uh, first. So, uh, maybe I'm confused. No, getting minus means multiply and get this. Get to the minus. So, uh, so minus i times i. Uh, yeah, you see, e to the power i alpha h times e to the power i beta h gives e to the power minus two point function, oh, okay. Okay. but the two point function had yeah. a minus z. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Suppose we took e to the power i minus i nu nu minus half h, then this the op will get rid of this term. And therefore, for n greater than or equal to 0, would be 0. OK? On the other hand, uh, here, what would the OP do? I think it's better to subtract of a 1 uh, or just add or subtract. Of one. Exactly. Exactly. Here, what would the OP do? Here, it would give you a z to the power plus nu minus half. So the plus nu cancels the minus nu. But it makes it plus uh, uh, minus one, and therefore only for n greater than or equal to one is it zero. So it's totally perfect. Okay, and therefore 
the operator O is is equal to e to the power minus i nu minus half h. And the Exactly. So it was the identity. Exactly. <coughs> okay. So, uh, so exactly right. So, so what we have here is that the the uh, uh, the vacuum state, the vacuum state uh, of this theory, in general, is going to be a uh, is going to be dual to the operator O, which is this. And then you can convince yourself that all other states in the theory, that all other states in the theory are just built by acting with the usual chiral algebra on this operator. Okay, that uh, um, in fermionic, for instance, if you want to put a fermionic oscillator, you would act with some psi or derivatives of psi. You want to put additional fermionic oscillators. You would act with psi or derivatives of psi in this. Or uh, 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 in bosonic language, you can put e to the power i m h times derivatives of h on this. And that will give you all the other states in this Hilbert space. It's the usual story that you act with the good stuff, you know, the stuff that includes the stress tensor and so on, the nice part of the algebra on the vacuum the vacuum state to generate your whole, <coughs> the whole thing. So the important thing was generating the operator dual to the vacuum, then all the other operators followed more or less free. Okay, so this is very interesting and it makes many, many predictions. Prediction number one. What is new prime? Different sectors. One is new sector, one is new prime sector. Uh huh. You will not get a new Yeah, you will not get mutually local things, you say. Yes. Yes. So you will not easily be able to mix sectors. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you try to mix sectors, you'll have to do it very carefully. That will be part of our game oh. to mix Nebuchadnezzar and Ramon. <laughs> uh, but uh, you will have to do it very carefully. Uh, as, you will see, as, you, as you will see. Okay, excellent. So uh, now this, this construction uh, is very beautiful and makes many uh, immediate, uh, uh, many immediate check, uh, many immediate, I mean, has many immediate uh, implications. First one is what is the dimension of this operator? Okay, so this is now a prediction for the energy of this twisted sector vacuum state. Okay, the prediction has to be done with a bit of care because you have to use the Schwarzian derivative to remember that the scaling dimension and the of uh, operators maps to the energies of states only after a shift the C by whatever, 24 or whatever it was. Okay, so we have to do that shift, but that makes a prediction then for the uh, energy of the vacuum. <coughs> now, the energy of the vacuum was so something we became really expert at calculating last semester by doing the Casimir energy calculations. Do you remember? We summed 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and found it was minus 1 by 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the end of the last semester, we did the same thing for the Nebuchadnezzar sector and the Ramon sector. And you know, we, we just really understood how to do it very, very well. So I'm going to leave this, this thing to you for you as an exercise. And I'll urge somebody to, to, to do it and maybe even present it at the beginning of tomorrow's class. So the exercise is check this is consistent. Does everyone understand what the exercise is? 
or how to proceed for this exercise? It's clear to, clear to everyone? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the exercise? So, you see, suppose you were in the vac you were just working in this va in the cylinder picture, and you wanted to compute the vacuum. So C is equal to half plus half. And, and then uh, only, only when the C is on the, there will be correction depending on C. Yes. Because you are making this. Some 1 by 24, or some sim simple thing. 1 by 24 thing. minus 1 by 24. Yeah, yeah maybe minus because 1. Because otherwise you don't get tachyon for one of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because it is called the Yeah, 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 yeah. Minus 1 by 24 will be? Yes, exactly. So the the. You know, if we were working in the cylinder, uh, how would you compute the vacuum energy? Okay. Well, firstly, why is there a vacuum energy? Because of zero point energies. Let's remember bosons have positive zero point energy, and fermions have negative zero point energy. Okay. So, what was the zero point energy for? Uh, for the psi oscillators, it was <coughs> what was the, the uh, moding of the psi oscillators? It was uh, uh, so, uh, and we want this to be negative. So it was basically uh, n minus nu, right? So the energy was n minus nu for n is equal to 1 to uh, infinity. If you are writing the Hamiltonian in terms of this mode. Exactly. And then the frequencies of each of the oscillators. Okay. Similarly, there is the moding for the Saiba oscillators. Okay. Now the zero point energy is these modes divided by 2 with the right sign to be fermions. So what you have to do is a sum like this, there's a 2 and then add the other part and regulate that sum the way we always do. We do that very carefully. Evaluating that gives you the vacuum energy using the same techniques that we use to get the, okay? And check that this vacuum energy is consistent with, with the dimension of this operator after you've you do the shift for going from cylinder to, to plane. Okay, it's a nice exercise. Check it. Uh, by the way, there's another <laughs> interesting prediction about this. You remember that there was a charge. There was a charge current, right? It's cu the current operator was uh, psi bar psi on the fermion side. This is the charge current for phasing psi with charge 1 and phasing psi bar with charge minus 1. Okay, or on the boson side was just shifting H. Now notice that this guy is not invariant on the shifts of H. Yes, it is charged. Yes, in fact, it picks up charge nu minus half. It is charged with min, or with charge minus of nu minus half. Under uh, under this 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 uh, this symmetric. Okay, this is something that we will be keep we will keep in mind. Um, in particular, unless um, unless nu is equal to half, which is the Nebuchadnezzar sector, this object here carries charge under that charge. This, this, this state carries some charge under that, that symmetry, and that will be important for us in a little while. Okay. Now, why we work this out in great generality? Uh, the there we are really most interested in this business for the special case nu equals uh, zero. Well, nu equals half, of course, is the Nebuchadnezzar, and we, <coughs> that was just the algebra itself. We didn't need to do all this fancy stuff. But uh, a nu equals zero is the Raman sector. Okay? A nu equals zero is the Raman sector, and uh, uh, nu, a nu equals zero is the Raman sector, and uh, um, uh, in this sector, the operator due to the vacuum is e to the power minus i h by 2. Notice that there is another operator <coughs> with the same energy as this operator, which is e to the power i h by 2. This is op 
this is the operator that you get by taking psi and acting uh, on it with e to the power minus i h acting on the vacuum operator and the first term in the op will be this guy there will be some power of z and then there will be this guy Uh, e to the power plus, sorry, plus and minus, sorry, sorry, the psi bar acting on plus will give you this guy. Okay, now why was it, why was it that if for this particular case nu equals half, um, notice that for no other value of nu. Uh, I'm sorry for correcting you this morning. I am talking about nu equals 0, sorry, I thank you, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes, nu equals 0, <coughs> nu equals 0, yes, sorry, so notice that for no other value of nu, uh, will you get this kind of degeneracy, the vacuum will just be the, you, you know, unique, the lowest energy state, lowest di dimension operator in this sector. Uh, for every other value of this u, which is related to the Raman sector has lots of zero modes. The, the Raman sector, and in fact, with one psi and one psi bar, has precisely the zero. The as Indranil said, as and as we've seen before, uh, psi and psi bar are both periodically quantized on the cylinder, and the zero modes obey the algebra psi zero, psi bar zero, anti-commutator is equal to one, and generate a two-state system which commu commutes with the Hamiltonian. And the two states in this two-state system are the two different vacua, the e to the power i h by 2 and e to the power minus i h by 2. Okay, fine, I think we'll, let's, let's stop this discussion, <coughs> this discussion. But you moving from one vacua to the other, you will be in a non-partition in the… In the algebra. In, in the uh, Nebus first. Yes, that's always, once you have the vacuum, you generate the whole Hilbert space by acting on the vacuum with the operators in the basic chiral algebra. Yes, yes, yes. All the interior. yes. So, this is an example of that. If you acted with the converse quantity, if you acted with the converse, sorry. Well, just, just with cyber. I acted with an operator in the chiral algebra. <coughs> okay, questions or comments? Okay, so let's stop today. We'll continue tomorrow. Uh, to, in tomorrow's class, we will, uh, I will explain uh, how to bosonize the BC system, and then we will go on to the beta gamma system, and we will try to bosonize the beta gamma system, which is a strange thing to do since the beta gamma system is already bosonic. <laughs> but you know what we will do is fermionize it and then bosonize it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>